Well, this is uh, going to be my final textual sermon as your preacher. Next week is Senior Sunday when we honor our graduating seniors, and I want to urge you to be here for that. I've known most of these kids since the day they were born. So have most of you. And I think as spiritual family members, we need to be here to show our love and our support as they enter into a new phase of their lives. Then I will be speaking, I think, on May 29th, but that's not going to be a textual sermon. So this is my last word from the Word. And our text is the very last part of the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verses 6 through 21. And I'd like to read that to you right now. You can follow along with me. The angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspires the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Look, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I had heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But he said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your fellow prophets and with all who keep the words of this scroll. Worship God. And he told me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this scroll, because the time is near. Let the one who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let the vile person continue to be vile. Let the one who does right continue to do right. And let the holy person continue to be holy. Look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they've done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. But I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away that person, any share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this scroll. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, and the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. The very first thing that we read in this text is that the angel gives a testimony that these words, I think that's the whole book of Revelation. That's everything written in that scroll of prophecy. These words are trustworthy and they are true. They are reliable because they are the words of God himself. And God is named here, the Lord, the God who inspires the prophets. In other words, he is the God who rules over the spirits and the hearts of his messengers. And what they speak is what God wants spoken. Now that means nothing to those who choose to disbelieve. It means nothing to them. But for people of faith, this is a call for us to listen, for us to understand, and for us to obey the words that God has given us. Once again, as, as we found, if you've read the book recently, in chapter 1, the angel says that John has been shown things that must soon take place. And that phrase either means in a short time or quickly, at once, without delay. 
And when I read that, it reminds me that Revelation isn't about some distant future events. It's not about that. It was written first for those original readers, and it was written for every generation that followed, including ours, and the generations that will follow us. The book is really about what I'm doing and what I'm thinking today, not about something that is somewhere out there in the nebulous future. It's about how I live and what I do and what I think today. Now, a lot of Christians look at world events, war, terrorism, poverty, environmental issues, economic woes, earthquakes, all of those kind of things, and they see them as signs of the Lord's return. And they really don't then do the work that they should be doing. Feeding the hungry, working for justice, loving their neighbors, proclaiming the good news of Jesus, and, and just living a godly, passionate life in the name of Jesus. Some people just want to predict the future. And let me tell you, prediction and getting caught up in all of that can become a substitute for action and for obedience. Let's not let that happen to us. We are called to obedience. We are called to live life now and not worry too much about what's going to happen out there in the future. Now, in verses 8 and 9, very interesting to me, we see a repeat of something that had happened also, back in chapter 19, verse 10 of the book of Revelation, John falls at the feet of the angel in worship, and he is again rebuked, and he's told, don't do that, but worship God. And I had to ask the question, why did John have such a hard time getting it right? Why do we have such a hard time getting this right? Is it perhaps because... It's easier to indulge in ecstasies rather than to be obedient? Is it easier to pursue our fascination with the supernatural rather than to serve God? It, 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 it just amazes me how when people read Revelation and other similar parts of Scripture, they get caught up in everything in those readings, in those books, except God. People get lost in symbol hunting and in numerology and in speculation about times and seasons. But Revelation, my friends, like the rest of the Bible, is about God and it's about the Lamb. Revelation is not about the end of the world. It's not about the identity of the Antichrist. It's not a timetable of history. It's about Christ. And it was written to draw us into a deeper relationship with him, a relationship of faith and trust. And any interpretation that detracts from him should be rejected as phony. And people just get caught up in all sorts of things and they forget what it's about. So how do we keep our focus on Christ? Well, by doing what the angel told John. Worship God. Worship God. Worship shapes our lives. In both our private and our corporate worship, we retell the story of Jesus. We're going to do that in a moment. We've been doing it all through our time here together. We retell the story of Jesus. We, we will reenact the gospel here in a few moments in the bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper. We focus again and again on what God is doing in the world. And worship requires frequent repetition. And let me tell you, when you absent yourself from worship, not only private worship, but from the worship of the church, you run the risk of losing sight of Jesus Christ. That's why it's important for us to come together to worship God. And the conspiracy of the gang that runs Babylon, the dragon and the two beasts, their conspiracy is simply to eliminate our focus on God and on Christ. That's their whole plan. That's their whole plot. The devil's, the devil's idea is to trivialize Christ as this remote historical figure. Maybe he was a really good person, but he's not to be taken seriously today. And if he can get that done, that's all he cares about. And that's really the plot. We don't fight evil so much as we fight that kind of thing of the devil just saying, oh, Jesus, yeah, he was good, but don't, don't pay much mind. It's not all that important. Well, Christian worship 
enables us to focus on the power and the relevancy and the life-giving nature of Christ. Worship God. Don't get caught up in all this other stuff. Worship God. Now, when John is told by the angel, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, he's being told to make the message accessible and understandable. Revelation begins with this concept. Chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. I believe with all of my heart that God intends his people to hear and to understand and to obey the teaching in the book of Revelation. It was not written to confuse us. It isn't this puzzle that only a few people can figure out. Its teaching is to be obeyed because the time is near. And we, it's just something that we need to understand because it's about Jesus. It's about Christ. It's about what God has done and is doing in him. The time is near. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? You know, there are two uh, Greek words for time. Chronos is one of them. It has to do with clocks and calendars. And we are all really caught up in chronos. That's why we all wear one of these things on our wrist or we have it in our, our, uh, our cell phone and we have schedules and appointments. And all. We're really caught up in chronos. That's not the word used here. The word in our text is kairos. And that's more about ages and seasons and even opportunity. It's not about seconds and minutes and hours. And John seems to be saying that, that the season, the age in which these things will happen, it's here. It was at hand for those who first read the book. It's at hand for us. And God's people of every age should be ready and prepared and fortified by the words of this prophecy. Now the words of verse 11 are a little difficult to understand when he says, Okay, just let the one who does wrong keep on doing wrong. Let the person who's vile continue to be vile. Let the person who does right, let them do right. That seems to have to do with the warnings of the whole book. See, if the wrongdoer, if the vile person will not hear and be warned by these words, then there's nothing that can be done. Let them go on with their evil ways. But when the righteous and the godly hear these words, let them go on living in faith. They will receive their reward. I said a few weeks ago, this seems to be what God's doing. He seems to be letting history just run its course. And for those who are not going to believe, they'll go on doing whatever they're going to do until time comes for judgment. But let those who believe, let those who are righteous, let those who are godly, let them go on with their lives as well because there is a reward for them. In fact, I think verses 12 through 15 emphasize this truth. The eternal state of people is directly related to their present life. I will give to everyone according to what they have done. And those who have washed their robes, and remember, back in chapter 7, verse 14, we wash our robes in the blood of the Lamb. But those who have washed their robes, they have access to the tree of life right now access to the tree of life. We are allowed to go into the city through the gates. We are part of the eternal kingdom of God. Those who reject the gospel, they're described as dogs, which is a symbol of everything that's unclean. These people are left outside the holy city. They are not part of God's kingdom. Now, in the book of Revelation, have you noticed that there's always a sense of urgency Jesus says, look, I'm coming soon. Says it in verse 7, says it in verse 12, says it in verse 20. Look, I'm coming soon. And all of us here, I think, believe that Jesus, he is coming again. Literally, actually, historically, he's going to come again. But when scripture tells us that, it is not to scare us out of our wits. I remember some sermons that I heard and, and probably preached that were, that were about the second coming and they were just designed to scare people to death. That's not why this is written. 
These are not written so that we can have some group of, of prophets who try to predict the date when this is all going to happen. What he's doing, I want you to hear this and think about it. What he's doing by saying, I'm coming soon, is firmly placing himself ahead of us at the end, just as he firmly established himself at our beginning. He joins our beginning and he joins our end so that we can live coherent, meaningful lives in between. And when he says he's coming soon, I think it's very much like what he says in our text. I'm the alpha and the omega. I am the first and the last. I'm the beginning and the end. I completely surround your life. I've got you front and back. That's what I think he's saying. Not here, oh, Jesus is coming back and I ought to be scared to death because am I ready? And No, he's saying, look, I'm here. I was at the beginning and I'm at the end. And he firmly establishes our lives in that way. Now, the expectation of his return provides a goal that shapes and, and unifies our lives right now. This urgency is liberating because it, it forces us to stay alert, doesn't it? Always aware of who we are, always aware of where we're going. His coming frees us from the trivia of this life, from getting involved in things that really don't, don't matter that much. And something else to consider in this idea of urgency is that urgency is not a call to hurry or to rush. If John had been in a hurry, if John had been in a panic, like I see some people today, oh, they're panicked. Oh, the world's coming to an end. Look at all. They're panicked. It, this is not what he's doing here. If he had been in a rush, he would have written his message not in these complex structures and multi-level symbols. He wouldn't have written that. He would have, he would have reduced everything to a slogan. One slogan that you could, you could shout while you're on the run. Urgency must never be understood as hurry and panic. And he's not in, in a panic at all. Now, did you also notice that the one who sends this message, Jesus, is the root and the offspring of David. I had never thought of this in the way that I want to present it right now. That speaks of his deity and his humanity. He's the root of David. He is the life source of David and at the same time, the offspring of David. Deity and humanity wrapped up together in the one we call Jesus. He is God and he is human and he's the one who sends us the message. He also is the bright morning star. It is Jesus who ushers in this, this dawn of the new day, a new age. And he did so when he came in the flesh and when he died on the cross and when he was resurrected. Now, verses 18 and 19, we won't talk about it much. That's just a warning not to trifle or take lightly the revealed word of God. Just don't take it lightly. And then, then the book, and I think so rightly that the whole part of canonical scripture ends with an invitation to come. Verse 17, verse 20. And I've often wondered also about that statement, amen, come Lord Jesus. I don't think it's so much about his second coming as it is about his coming into our hearts and into our lives through the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, certainly. I think we all want Jesus to return. I really do. And he most certainly will return. But of equal importance is that he comes into my life. Is that he comes into my heart to live. And I think maybe that's what John's saying. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come into my life. Take control of my life. So I, I, I would say to you that, that Revelation is not so much about the future. It's about every Christian's present situation. And we're called to come to Christ. To put our trust in Him. And there's where we find the real solution to the lives that we live every day. Not too long ago, I read a book called Soul Tsunami by Leonard Sweet. And... Uh, as I have already mentioned, he talked about some of the problems that we face today. Climate changes across the planet, 
species extinction, environmental destruction, a growing segregation between the wealthy and the poor, rampaging microbes, deadly plagues, epidemic of violence and terrorism, overpopulation, overconsumption, and a growing rejection of God's people of faith. Do you know what? We're not unique. We're not unique. Every generation has had a similar list. Every generation has had to face things like that. The first readers of Revelation faced the, the, the godlessness and the persecution of the mighty Roman Empire. And they had to deal with poverty. They had to deal with the detestable practices of idol worship. It wasn't a whole lot different for them. And in other centuries, the list it may be a little different, but it's basically the same. Revelation for those first readers and for us and for whoever reads it in the future provides us with the stability that we need to endure whatever the world throws at us. It puts the world in proper perspective. Jesus is victorious over all the forces of the enemy. All evil has been defeated by the power of the cross and the resurrection, and that's where we find our place to stand. And so we pray, come Lord Jesus. That's a very contemporary prayer. It is a prayer that applies right now. It isn't just looking out to the future sometime when he might come, maybe a thousand years from now. No, it is very contemporary. And I hope you'll pray with me every day of your lives. Come, Lord Jesus, come into my heart right now. Come into my life today. Change me. Help me to serve God. Help me to be part of the kingdom. Come into my heart. Looking forward then to the time when he will, literally, actually, historically, come and be with us again. I invite you and encourage you, if you've never let Jesus, first of all, come into your heart, never put your trust in him, never acknowledge that he's the son of God, your Lord and Savior. I want you to do that today. And as you invite him to come into your life, we would encourage you to be buried with him in baptism, to put on Christ in baptism. I'd, I'd love to see some of you who've never done that do it today on my basically last Sunday. But if you would, while we sing this song about him coming, let us know how we can help you. Let's stand together while we sing.